Tracy? Sure thing. Hello and welcome this afternoon to our third consecutive E4 uh, with a panel focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, my name is Tracy Schaefer and I work with Exerta Zelmo on PR and media relations. It's with my great pleasure to introduce this session um, called It's Everyone's Responsibility, Bringing Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion into AV. So let's have a conversation about DEI. What is it? Um, why is it a necessity for companies to thrive? How can we take action as AV professionals to bring DEI into AV? And how do AV products play a role in helping create a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive workforce? These are just some of the topics we're gonna dive into this session, with the bottom line all leading back to this. Cultivating an industry of diversity, equity, and inclusion is everyone's responsibility. So, moderating this panel today, we have Melody Craigmile, who is the Vice President of Marketing and Communications for Elmo Corporation. Uh, creator of the E4 Experience brand and uh, the recipient of Dealer Scope's 2022 Powerful Women in Technology Award. Um, our panelists include Kim Lonis, who's next, um, Global Diversity and Inclusion Program Lead for Exertus. Um, Kim is also a member of Avixa's Diversity Council. Um, she was integral in the creation of the new Avixa Mosaic Scholarship, which is awarded to individuals with diverse backgrounds whose thinking will influence the future of the global AV industry. And we have Alicia Henley, who is a business development manager at Sennheiser, a multimedia journalist, a social media influencer, and a prominent and energetic well-known voice in AV. Um, and last on our panel, we have Rob Voorhees, who is the Business Development Manager for Exertus Almo and a member of uh, VIXA's Diversity Council. Um, we're gonna have time at the end for questions. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to our moderator, Melody Craigmel. All right, thank you, Tracy. And thanks everybody for joining us uh, today. It's, um, I think it's really important to have these conversations in our industry and I wanna thank my panelists who are, are joining me today. And um, so I just kind of wanted to start out with Kim and just talk a little bit about, um, you know, what your role is and, and the role that DE&I plays at uh, Exertus and, you know, how you describe that to people. And people just kind of look at it this overarching kind of topic, but maybe you could just hone in a little bit on how you see DE&I. Sure. Um, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, my role for uh, Exertus or um, the technology division of DCC um, includes about 5,000 employees worldwide and over 20 different uh, locations. And I, I work with each of the businesses to help educate and raise awareness around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And just to define what those terms mean, um, you'll oftentimes hear DEI, and that talks about the programs and policies that a business has in place to ensure that an environment or um, a culture is diverse, equitable, and inclusive. Um, and diversity is more than gender. It's more than race. Um, there are a lot of layers to diversity, um, and it's part of my job to educate on on that within the business um, and outside of the business uh, doing sessions like this. So what are some of the, the things that businesses, large or small businesses, can, can start to implement um, to, to broaden their reach for, for DE&I and, and what would be some of your suggestions on maybe places to start? Yeah. I think I think the first thing is if somebody has an interest is finding out what your company currently is doing. Um, do they have programs in place? You can start with your senior leadership. You can start with your human resource department. A lot of times um, diversity, equity, and inclusion will sit within human resources, but it shouldn't be tasked 
to HR. It should be enabled by human resources. People within the company at different levels, different positions should be able to support the initiatives um, and find out what's important to your company and then start the conversation. Um, find out um, you know, what's the priority, how you can align, because there are a lot of benefits to DEI in the workplace and from a, a customer base standpoint too. Yeah, Alicia, I see you shaking your head when she says that it shouldn't start and stop at HR. It's really uh, more far-reaching, and, and I totally agree with you, Kim, that it can't just be an HR, you know, watch these videos kind of thing. It has to be organic. Alicia? Yeah, I thought your statement about enabling that type of deal from inside of HR instead of it being a task, right? Because that's where you kind of run into hindrance if people feel it has to be a task. There should be something that's free-flowing and you're able to discuss internally with leadership and not just HR, right? Absolutely, and it has to be authentic because what one person's lived experience is compared to another, um, you're not gonna get that unless you start talking with different levels within an organization, different people with different backgrounds. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're ta we've talked about uh, you and Rob being on the AVIXA uh, de Night committee. I think it's important for trade associations to also play a part of that and also manufacturers. Um, Rob, from, from your perspective, what, what is the task of the AVIXA committee and, and, you know, what is your, your job as a committee member and how do you think that's influencing the industry? I think one of the, the most key components to it is building that awareness and the education and furthering that education because as you just said it shouldn't stop and start with HR so by having these monthly calls and these these meetings and get-togethers that we have it could just be a general discussion where we touch on a couple of key bullet points or initiatives of how we want to further that that month's message or or what kind of initiatives we want to take at infocom for an example or at, or at an e4 um, as i mentioned to you on this past call they allowed us to highlight what we talk about at e4 and, and they're trying to highlight different organizations whether it be exertus almo an integrator a vendor anybody that is doing their part to further the message and awareness because the one thing that i've learned um, from my daughter who's on the autism spectrum and she's kind of getting out there into the job market now is she only applies at businesses that she thinks are going to be accepting of her and I said well Samantha how do you know if they're accepting of you and she said I go on their website I look at what some of their you know press is about what you know are they already taking steps to get out there and get the message out and by Avixa and Exertus Almo and a lot of other uh, manufacturers doing the same thing, that's what's helping us further that message. Mm -hmm. So let, let's, uh, so everybody knows this month is World Autism Awareness Month, as you're bringing about, and I think uh, people are becoming a lot more aware of neurodiversity as part of DE&I, and I know that we, we talk about that in terms of AV design, but also programs, like you said. Um, but Alicia, from a, um, from a neurodiversity standpoint, what are some of the things that integrators can, can look at or can, can start the dialogue with their clients about how to be accommodating to um, people with neurodiversity? I think it's across the board of almost every kind of diversity as well. We just have to be focused on ADA compliance, right? Not an afterthought. When you go into your client's space, how are we looking at the technology we're implementing into a space and looking at it from a diverse perspective? How is it affecting people that are sensitive to light? How are people that may be hard of hearing uh, being able to be included in conversations and feel a part of the companies? I think sometimes it's kind of been on the back burner, right? When you go in to build a space, you think about, oh, wheelchair accessible or if there's a place with stairs, is there elevators? But there's a lot of other uh, avenues to diversity and we have the technologies that we can implement into these spaces to help uh, make these spaces more inclusive. So start with ADA compliance. Don't let it be an afterthought because you will get fined too, right? Like it's something that's extremely important that you should lead with when it comes to uh, the compliance side of it. But also when you lead with this, um, 
it shows your company culture, that you actually care, we're human, um, and it gets you engaging with the client and building better rapport as well. Yeah, I think it is, it's, it's, you know, educating the client on on what those regulations are, but not just in terms of regulation, but um, in terms of customer experience, right? I mean, I know my, my own mother is, uh, you know, she is hearing impaired, and uh, a lot of times if she goes into a house of worship, you know, it's just, it's, it's not a great experience for her. She can't understand. It's intelligible because there's concrete walls. There's no sound masking. It's just... You know, it, it, it's about making for the customer experience or the end user, you know, really not just accommodating, but making it for a great experience for them. And, and that that's, in my opinion, like one of the great things that AV can bring is that freedom for people or the enablement of them to be able to share in the experience. And just to, to kind of piggyback, I, I love the analogy that she used um, mentioning like a wheelchair accessible ramp now not every disability is going to require that ramp, but the mere fact that it's there will show somebody this is an accessible building for me. With neurodiversity and specifically autism, it's not one, one size fits all. Um, my daughter being on the higher functioning side of things isn't going to necessarily require the same uh, accommodations as somebody on the lower side of the spectrum will. But we went to a, a recent autism awareness event and this is how simple it is to educate ourselves is they literally had a room with different pamphlets about you know how to enter the workforce uh, one was how to go food shopping it's like teaching parents on, on how to accommodate this and one of them was what are workplace accommodations that you should look for and the event we were at had nothing to do with AV but they touch on the lighting um, not saying that you have to go into every project and immediately suggest swapping out all the fluorescent lights and, and this and that, but maybe have a wing of your office that does have different lights. Or in my daughter's case, she hates natural sunlight. She thinks the glare is too blinding. So have some offices that have darker blinds and, and little accommodations like, like that rather than just going through and thinking, okay, I have to have this room for this person, this room for this person. You just have to take a couple of natural steps like that to educate yourself and you'll see how, how easy it can be. Yeah, well, Kim, go Sorry, ahead. Kim. If I can just jump in, I, I love what both of you are saying because it, it shouldn't be, I come to an office and I'm new to the company and these are the accommodations I need because that as a new employee can be really daunting to ask for accommodations. So if a business can show that you are um, neurodiverse friendly or you know um, diversity friendly, whatever those needs may be, it, you may not have it in that moment, but it does allow that new employee the opportunity to say, this is my need, can you help me? And they feel a little bit more comfortable about it. Yeah, we're in the business of experience design. And a lot of people take that differently, right? Experience design could be theme parks, it could be anything, right? And I think in a corporate setting, we're also um, designing for an experience. And the way we could become proactive by doing that is making sure that these type of uh, technologies and these fourth thoughts are in place beforehand so it's not as daunting. You can walk in and say, oh, I'm home, right? When you go into an interview, oh, wow, this feels like home. I feel comfortable here. So it, it boils down to creating an experience and being mindful of everyone in that experience and then being proactive about that because a company might not have any type of diversity yet but design for the future, design for the culture that you want. And I think that's extremely powerful and we have the power to do, to do that in AV. Yeah, so just shifting gears a little bit, you know, we've been hearing a lot about um, this concept of uh, meeting equity, right? So people on, that are in the office, right? And then we have a lot of hybrid workplaces and making accommodations to make sure that people who are working remotely or working hybrid are as a part of the meeting as they are in person. So um, I know that Exertus Alma has been working on some initiatives in that regard in terms of retrofitting our conference rooms and things, but I think we don't, we don't automatically think about equity in terms of the, the meeting, but since COVID, this has become an integral part of what we've been doing as an industry. Rob? You know, I, I actually, 
was thinking about that topic uh, during Gary's keynote address because he talked about uh, Microsoft Teams front row. And that was actually a, a note that I had written down for this because front row helps with you know, making others feel like they're equal because of the layout and, and having, you know, the camera eye level and you're not staring off into the corner and, and certain things like that. Um, when it comes to the hardware, and I've, I've talked to some customers who go so far as to actually have a, like, hardware welcome kit for their employees so every employee working from home has the same camera, same headphones. Now, obviously, bandwidth is a piece of that and you can't, kind of dictate what you have at somebody's house, but it's little steps like that that kind of go a, a long way into making somebody feel comfortable that way. Um, but that's really all I would say about that, is it really has a lot to do with the hardware and making sure that, you know, again, everybody's not created equally in their setting, so little steps like that could help. Alicia, I know that audio is uh, <laughs> an important part of that, and I was just speaking with, uh, with somebody, and they said, you know, what, what is the most important thing in the meeting room? And I said, well, it's, we talked a lot about cameras this morning, right? But it's the audio, right? If you can't hear, if it's not intelligible, if you can't hear somebody, then you can do without video, right? So I think we have to really emphasize when we're talking about meeting equity that audio is such an integral part of that and sometimes we really focus on the video and is it 4k is it this but yeah yeah always lead with the audio it's the most important like communication within communication everything that we do we're honestly leading with the audio because that's how we're communicating across businesses internally within our own businesses with friends when we just have i don't know an online happy hour right we want to hear what people are saying so always lead with the audio and i think the way to do that is by being again proactive with those hardware kits um, making sure people have the same type of gear, make sure they have a, a decent level of quality gear. Um, and if you don't have external devices, make sure you have a decent computer, right? Make sure you're sending out uh, great laptops that have high processing or something like that. Um, but there's a lot of ways to go about it. And I think it just depends on budget sometimes too as well. Well, that's, and not to cut you off, but that's the nice thing about a lot of those components is we're not talking you know, the conference room level equipment, you can do a USB mic and, and a decent webcam for yep. a few hundred dollars. So, I mean, we're not talking these really expansive systems, so budget is usually a, a pretty easy factor there. And what I wanted to, to segue into that is, um, when we start talking about this and retrofitting meeting rooms and all the things that we, that we need to do to be accommodating, for a lot of corporations, they're hearing, oh, this is a lot of money, this is a lot. But Kim, I just wanted you to speak to really the benefits from a, from a, from a company standpoint, um, including recruiting people and retaining people. What are the benefits from a business standpoint? If you're in front of a CEO and they say, well, why should I be investing in DE&I? Tell us what, how we can quantify that. Well, that's a great question, um, and, I, and before I go to that, I just want to say, recently, like yesterday, I was in a meeting, and my audio went out, and it was like I was just, you know, like you go through a drive-through, yeah. <laughs> and it was, I, we should talk afterwards, so for a travel perspective, how do I handle that? Um, but from a D&I perspective, when you're sitting in front of the CEO or your leadership team, there are cultural benefits, there are financial benefits to a business, um, and I think when you look at DE&I today, we, you can't afford not to have a program in place. 80% of businesses currently have DE&I programs in place, and a lot are looking to align with other businesses that have the same um, philosophy towards business and diversity and inclusion just makes sense. It's the right thing to do. Um, but from a cultural standpoint, people will come to work and they're going to feel like they can be their true selves in the workplace. They're going to, and, and when that starts happening, they feel safe and they start to share. And when sharing starts, that's when collaboration happens, that's when innovation happens. So there are a lot of really um, strong benefits to the individual. And then for a business standpoint, 
retention. Um, if people are happy in what they're doing and they feel that their voice is truly heard, they're going to stay with the company, so it's going to reduce your turnover um, as well. Um, Gender diverse companies, for example, are 17% more, have, show 17% more financial returns. Um, are, and there are a number of statistics that support um, DE&I in the workplace. Um, and so really, I guess the question would be, why wouldn't you want to do it? And then ask those questions and be educated when you go into the meeting to, to understand the business case behind it and then address it one by one. So Alicia, when we're talking about the AV industry, and obviously let's just all be honest, it is obviously very, very male dominated. I'm glad to, to see a lot of guys here in the session today. Um, you know, how do we as an industry become more diverse? What are some, what are some things that companies can do that will open up the doors for a more diverse industry? In your opinion? Uh, my opinion is. Um, C-levels can have more discussion about why there's usually only men in those rooms, why are there are not many women inside of the C-suite, right? Um, I think it starts internally there, right? We need to have some allies in those board meetings vouching for women who have been on the job for 15, 20 years but still have never made it past director or management, right? What's that? What's that glass ceiling that people like to say, or what is that barrier that's holding that? And I think it should be a good internal discussion. Get down to the bottom of it, see, see what's going on. Um, also, recruitment. Uh, it's not like we're going into an all-girls school, you know, promoting AV. Um, when we should, we can. Um, it's just it's gonna continue to take work. So I think we need to kind of reach outside of our own industry to pull people in. Um, and not just women, right? People of color, um, younger generations that are still maybe middle school, high school, just open their minds to opportunities that they might not know about. Uh, so there's a lot of ways we can each individually do that, and there's a lot of ways we can do that together as, a, as an industry. So Alicia, I remember from our last discussion that we had, one of the things that you brought up that I thought was very interesting is on the job descriptions for many AV installation jobs, it says, must be able to lift X amount of pounds. Mm -hmm. And for many women that is says to them, Well, I can't do this. I can't I can't be an installer on this job. But just I, I thought that was so fascinating to me. I was like, I never thought about that. But women can be installers. Yeah, absolutely. We can pull our own weight. Um, but half of women probably will not apply to it just because it's written that way. Just like I didn't used to apply to jobs because it said I need to have a bachelor's degree. But I had the experience. So there, it was a time in my career where I was like, all right, am I just gonna apply for something that I don't technically qualify for and just get in the room? Or am I gonna keep holding myself back because of these words and barriers on you know, a, a resume or a job requirement and things like that? So uh, it comes with a leap of faith, I can't lie. <laughs> and I mean, some things just need rewording. Maybe it's not 50 pounds, maybe it's 35 pounds, maybe it's 20 pounds. See if that person can get in there and pull their own weight. I don't think that should, I think that's a barrier. Kim, have there been discussions at Exerta Salmo about, I, I know I, I've been in some of these discussions about revising job descriptions, um, making it more accessible, and even wording and, and things of that nature that, that doesn't make it so closed off to you know, specific gender? Yeah, um, this past year, we as an organization provided guidance to all of our businesses on inclusive hiring practices and what that looks like. Part of it was job postings because you're right, if a, a woman looks at a job, um, unless she can do 100% of the items that are listed, she's not going to apply where a man will be like, okay, I can do 20% of it, I'm applying. And, and there is a difference there. And so we need to look at those job descriptions from a, a gender neutral lens to say, okay, one, let's take a look at the wording to make sure that it's not attracting just one specific type of individual. And then what are really the top three things that are must haves within that position? Um, let's start with those and then the others are nice to haves. And you know, obviously some positions are more physical than others, but we need to not judge uh, based on, you know, 
what you can do. Like my daughter, she's um, she's 20 and she can lift a lot, but she's a tiny little thing mm -hmm. and you wouldn't know it to meet her. So I think we need to look at hiring through a different lens and the best way to do that is panel, dis panel interviews. So it's not just one person making the decision because my decision may be different than yours and may be different than yours, but let's come together and discuss a candidate and their ability to do a job based on different perspectives. So we have done quite a bit in, in setting up guidance for all of our businesses. A lot of companies like on job descriptions too, what I noticed would just always say he, right? Or him would have to have these, this, this, and this. Yeah. That's always interesting. But I just want to throw something at Rob. I'm not trying to take over as a moderator. Go, back, go right ahead. <laughs> what Kim mentioned is, right, this is something that we kind of assume, is that, oh, women won't apply if we don't, you know, hit that 100% capacity. And we say, oh, if men are at 80%, they will. Is that true? We talk about comfort zone a lot. Would you apply for something if you were at 80% of the things of checking the boxes off. Is that true or is this something kind of like a myth that has just been put out there? Great question. <laughs> so I gotta be honest, when it came to, I've been with, with first Almo and then Exertus Almo for about six and a half years now and the, I still remember to this day the job description for my role I checked a lot of the boxes. A lot of the boxes I didn't check, and I actually think the job was supposed to be based in Maryland, and I live in New Jersey. And I remember looking at that, and I told my wife, I said, I'm just gonna go into this interview and, and sell my butt off. I'm gonna sell this company on why they need to hire me, even though I don't check all of these boxes. One of the boxes was, you have to have your CTS in a certain amount of time. CTS scared me. I'm brand new to the pro AV space. I didn't even know what half of this hardware was. I got my CTS within my first year because I looked at that as in, I'm gonna sell myself on this interview, I'm gonna get the job and then hit, hit the ground running. So I agree with what you guys are saying though is, is you know, as women, you have to look at those positions and just have the confidence in yourself and the comfort in yourself to like, I'll, I'll put you on a pedestal, you know far more about pro AV than I do. And, and I, I mean, absolutely remarkable. So when you go into a job interview, you know I'm gonna sell myself. I'm going to show what certifications I have, what knowledge I have, and as long as you have the comfort to do that, I think that puts you, you in a much better place. Yeah, I guess it's being comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> It's interesting because, and if I can jump in, you mentioned confidence, and I think women are confident, but I think, and, and this is maybe my own bias and, and from my own lived experience, but I do think that men self-promote mm -hmm. better or more often than women, where women think, well, I'm gonna work really hard and somebody's gonna notice the work that I do. Um, where I think really you need to start saying, okay, I'm gonna work really hard, but I'm also gonna tell you the work that I do. And it does make a difference. And, and I think that there is a, a gender difference there. Well, and I also, I also agree with what you said about kind of the verbiage and how we promote these jobs and things like that, because there are a lot of jobs when I was on the market that I remember looking at, and I was scared just looking at the job description. And I thought that I don't even know what half these words are, so I'm not gonna apply for it. So I would bet that women are in the same position and whether it's the weight or somebody using him or he in the job description. Um, so I think companies can do a much better job of that and that will help women with a confident side going into some of these roles. So it all plays a part overall. How many people actually here are comfortable with self-promotion? Wow, that was interesting. That, yeah, that was it. That's why I wanted to see. Okay, awesome. But that kind of proves the point right there to what Rob was saying. And for those who can't see, it was mainly men who were raising their hands. <laughs> interesting. We'll work on that. Don't yeah. worry. We'll all work on that together. So we're coming up on 30 minutes now, and uh, I just wanted to open it up for comments, questions, anybody that has. Uh, a great idea for a company on how maybe they can augment their DEI initiatives or or start or uh, anything. Yes. Well, a lot of things come to mind. This is a really good discussion, and I can think of several topics like pronouns and uh, ageism, um, ableism, of course. But uh, I think the the dominant thing is what about safety? So.
Don't forget to repeat the question. <laughs> that was a long question. <laughs> the, I guess I'll let you repeat. The question was, what about safety? Okay. So it's interesting that you bring that up and, and you specifically mention the LGBTQ community and I can speak to all um, different diversities. Um, within our organization, we've recently um, well, last year, one of our businesses started employee resource groups to create safe spaces for our employees, and we've launched that worldwide, and that means having a group of women or a group that identify as LGBTQ and their allies. You, so you don't necessarily have to be a member of that group, but you can be an ally to that group, so you have those safe spaces to talk, to share. Um, additionally, there are different organizations that you can partner with in the world. So for Exertus, we've recently entered into a global partnership with Stonewall, and Stonewall is an LGBTQ um, ad activist, and um, they have an outline of things that we can do to protect our employees when they travel to different countries that maybe are not LGBTQ friendly or have laws in place that would put them in harm's way. Um, so I think there are a lot of things that can be done, um, but the conversations need to take place at the highest level within the organization and be supported throughout. When you said safety, did you mean it that way or like actual physical safety? From a, from a physical standpoint, I've seen companies um, mostly that are connected to higher ed because that's a huge thing in our country. The shootings on schools, campuses, and how do we protect that? It has now fallen under AV. I've seen a lot of that. Making sure rooms are secure, uh, making sure you have plans, backup plans for God knows what these days, you know, but actually having safety plans in place, evacuations, um, and being sure that you're protecting all of your employees on each floor in every building and being able to have eyes on what's happening across facilities worldwide, right? <laughs> if you have a campus in San Francisco, you need the same thing that's happening in London. Um, so safety has become a huge priority. And I think that is also starting to fall under AV a lot as well. Yeah, yeah I, I, I just think, to, to ahead, touch Ralph. on that really quickly, um, it's an, it's an uncomfortable conversation to have sometimes, especially with, with some of the news and we're talking about higher ed. Um, we actually partner with a company called Defendry um, and that's exactly what they do. They have uh, equipment that basically ties into a property's existing alarm system and through cameras on the outside of the building, they can actually identify a threat before actually entering the property and locking doors and notifying authorities and, and things like that. So to Alicia's point, it, it absolutely is now trending into the AV realm and, and that's why we're getting involved in it. I've also seen companies start doing monthly check-ins with members across the, across the board, their team members. Do you feel safe? Like, is this a place where you actually feel safe? Have you seen somebody following you? Um, they have opportunities to report things where or are times where they feel unsafe, and then those times can be highlighted and monitored and watched throughout the security department. Um, it's something that's not perfect, but it was, it's a great point. Uh, we definitely have to start looking at things like that. Uh, I had recently, um, but maybe about a month ago, a friend of mine, uh, she's a woman in, in a director role, um, and she had to fire someone and that man came back onto the property and that was a safety issue, right? Um, but it was actually really tough situation for the company because not only was she a woman, she's a woman of color and then the, it became this whole thing because now race is involved and you know, just general hatred comes into so much of our conversations these days. It's really tricky to navigate, but safety is extremely important and I think it shouldn't be, it should be right up there with ADA compliance. Yeah, and I think there's also, um, for us as a company, there's, you know, different parts of your building have to have different types of security. You know, so for us, with our warehousing facilities, we've got millions of dollars of product in <laughs> these warehouses. So the, the, the sales office and the warehouse facility, you have to have different kinds, different levels of security. I think that's also something you have to be able to consult with your, with your client on in terms of what kind of camera system, what kind of locking systems, what kind of key card access, you know, all those things. And um, so, very good question. Let's move on. Anybody else have any comments, questions? Yes. Laura, did you? 
Oh, no, Laura's like, no, I'm just playing with my headphones. Okay, yes. Uh, The question is, how do you apply policy as it relates to DE&I? Yeah, like yeah. governmental policy. You have yeah. representatives on, on your state, local, federal representatives who are drafting the laws. And, uh, yes, and I think um, for us as an organization, every business is at a different level level or a different um, part of their journey within DNI. So some are just starting, some are more evolved, and I think that's where um, we do encourage individuals within the business that if there's something that they feel strongly about, that they can share that with others to have signatures to help impose change in a government. Um, but it, it really just depends on the specific situation. So. Recently, we had we have these Spotlight on Diversity webinars that we hold monthly, and we recently had an individual share of themselves very candidly, very openly, um, and at the end of that discussion, um, they also shared a policy that they wanted to have change in some of the legislation that was happening within their community, and they put that out there to ours and shared the link and made that available. Um, beyond that, um, from a government policy standpoint, I think we're probably still very early in our journey and that's some, an area that we can focus on in the future. So uh, I would just say, I don't know question. what was this coming from, but, oh, those are announcements. Um, let's face it, I mean, a lot in the AV industry, a l most, the majority of the companies are small businesses, right? So, I, you know, just want to talk about, and I'm gonna, this is kind of a challenge to the industry, maybe the NSCAs or the AVIXs of the world is, you know, uh, good questions, but, let, you know, primarily these are small businesses, so perhaps we join together for a toolkit for small businesses uh, or, or something like that or, you know, webinars or other education for you know expanding DEI initiatives because the majority of the companies are are small businesses and they're maybe not thinking in terms of legislation and I know Grant has a question. So. Yeah and, and before I give it to you Grant just to close off that's a really good point so the Avixa Diversity Council is made up of a lot of people within the industry from small businesses I mean that is something that could definitely if there's something specific that you want to have addressed, um, Avixa can assist with that. Um, come to any one of the monthly meetings for the Diversity Council. We're always looking for more people to join in new topics. Grant. What suggestions do you have on reaching out to communities to, to get people involved at a younger age from different cultures and diverse backgrounds in the AV pro So I'll touch on from a, a neuro No, um, the question the question was how do you reach out to other like organizations in the community and, and finding new talent and new people that way, correct? So from a neurodiverse standpoint, um, my family is very, very involved in a local summer camp in New Jersey. It's one of the largest ones. My wife's worked there for years. Um, so one of the things we've done is also in our township is a, an organization called the Peak Autism Awareness Center. Um, so we actually go to events at that location to not only position the camp, but position internships and talk to people on the autism spectrum to really, again, raise awareness, educate them on this is a neurodiverse friendly location, they're, they're looking for employees and campers and, and so on and so forth, because a lot of the time, speaking just on the neurodiverse side for a second, but you know, really with, with all forms of diversity and neurodivergence, some of, some of these people are, are so much more brilliant when they're in their comfort level. So when you're out there speaking of those comfort levels and talking about 
you know, just this camp for an example, I've seen my daughter flourish there and, and become somebody I never thought she was going to become. She was always so quiet. And, but when you get her in that realm, it's remarkable what she does. So seeking out different organizations like that, and just as an example, I can do a Google search for, you know, Autism Center New Jersey, and it'll give me a list of every single one. And that could, I mean, even from an Exertus Al Almo side, that could be something where we go to job fairs and, and set up a table at those events, and that's how I would get started personally. I'm gonna jump in. A another idea, and keeping in mind the different sizes of business, um, diversity, equity, inclusion doesn't have to have somebody who is designated to that position, like our company. Um, you could have anybody within the company who might have an interest in, say, high school students and mentoring. Um, is there somebody on your team who maybe you want to develop their skills, who wants to do a presentation at a local university, a local school, and if you talk to them and maybe target what, what universities or high schools or even grade schools you want to talk at, um, offer them that opportunity to represent the company, to go out, practice their presentation skills, and that's how we're also going to develop people within the business. Um, and I think if you even open that up within your business to find out who has an interest, um, you'll be surprised at how many people, for different reasons beyond gender, beyond race, have an interest in diversity. And it's just a matter of asking and seeing what you can come up with together. And uh, so, uh, one last comment, Alicia? Yeah, I would say uh, for me personally, I've took on the individual task of making it a priority uh, to go outside of AV and find people, and actually in AV and find people. So one of the things I started doing last year was, okay, uh, I went to a black technology event. Half of the people there were in AV, and I got all their contacts, so when people like you, Grant, hit me up for you know, um, a blog or something. I say, well, hey, I've done enough blogs, but you know what, I know some other people that we can amplify, right? Amplifying each other's voices. If you have somebody on your team internally that is not, uh, you know, hasn't graced a stage, hasn't graced a blog, or hasn't done a video about a project or a product, give them an opportunity. Uh, really, that's all it's about. Start amplifying each other's voices as much as we can. And I think that that brings us back, you know, to the title of this, uh, of this panel discussion was, it's everybody's responsibility bringing diversity, equity, and inclusion into AV. And so I appreciate those final thoughts of how we can all be a part and, and also elevate other people uh, within the industry forward of these initiatives. So I'd like to thank my panel again for being a part of this and like to thank everybody for joining us today. And uh, we will be back with a series in the fall and uh, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.